Seeking Wisdom Week 26, The Wrath of God, the books of Joel and Malachi. In this video, we will learn about two prophetic books, Joel and Malachi, both of whom ministered after the exile and repatriation. The prophet Malachi worked around 450 BC. The temple had been rebuilt and religious activities are once again taking place. However, the negativity of some people carries over to the religious side of their lives and they start doubting God's power, claiming God does not bring about the prosperity that had been spoken of by many of the prophets. Understandably, many of the wicked people were thriving and the good people had not received God's blessing. Additionally, the priests performed their ritual of worship without taking their faith seriously. All of this doubt caused many people to withhold their tithe for the temple some married foreigners and quarreling became a common occurrence. This situation brought about a strengthening of faith in Malachi and emphasized the spirit of the covenant God made with Moses. It is this covenant that must stem from the heart and be based on loving respect, not a casual observance of the laws. The prophet Malachi presents God as a great and powerful king. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great, and among the nations and in every place, incense is offered to my name, and a pure offering, for my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But who is also full of love for the people? I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Perhaps that is why some people think it is vain to serve God. What do we profit by keeping his command or by going about as mourners before the Lord of hosts? Or still, do worship, but it is only an outward form that God blames the people for their way of worship. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not wrong? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not wrong? Try presenting that to your governor. Will he be pleased with you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? The teachings of Malachi are still essential to our life of faith today. In our life of worship, an offering is an expression of our respect for God, so it must be an offering of value. Jesus helps us to understand that the value here is not only a material value, but comes from the depth of the soul of the giver. Malachi insisted on paying taxes to the temple. This was not only a contribution to material possessions, but a way to show that we belong to a united community and need to contribute to the community building. So the sacrificial offering is a good life according to God's will and his law. Return to me and I will return to you. Now we will look at the book of Joel. Most researchers believe this book was written around 400 BC after the Israelites returned to Jerusalem simply because there was no reference to the king and palace in the book. It also shows the importance of the temple, making it look like this book was wrote after 515 BC when the second temple was built. The book of Joel opens with the story of the locusts attacking and people completely giving up. This story reminds us of the difficulties and challenges we encounter in life. Of course, these difficulties cause human suffering, but at the same time, they also have a positive side because it helps us to be aware of our limited status and to seek help and kindness from the compassionate God. Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord, your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relents from punishing. The book of Joel also describes the day of God in very strong words. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. The Lord utters his voice at the head of his army. How vast is his host? Numberless are those who obey his command. Truly the day of the Lord is great, terrible indeed. Who can endure it? 
According to the apocalyptic style of writing, cosmic phenomena appear in the Lord's day. The sun will become dark, the moon will turn to blood. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shake. But the Lord is a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. The Israelites were once again asked to return to God. This return must include the heart, mind, and will of those returning. Keep in mind that returning to God is the opposite of sin, and a true comeback requires each person to give their full heart and give up all attitudes of deception, opposition, and eccentricity. And this return does not end the need for outward penance, but it links them to inner peace and the actions of those returning give sinners favorable conditions for change. We must remember that the doctrine of inner repentance and a person's act of penance is found with specificity in the book of John. When the subject of forgiveness is approached, we know a few things for certain. God is, above all, merciful and compassionate. And because he is merciful, we know all good can only originate from him. The special relationship between man and God is the main reason for the mercy and even though God will punish those when it is deemed necessary, he is slow to anger, but compassionate, kind, and rich in love. In the liturgical rite of penance, the prophet Joel wanted to arouse in the people the hope of accepting God's forgiveness with a question. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him? That question expresses God's hope of receiving forgiveness. And this hope is based on the conviction of his merciful kindness. This renewal of faith in God will mark a new age. In chapter 3, verses 1 to 2, we hear that God will pour out his spirit on all mankind. Chapter 3, verse 5, tells us that he will save all who call on God's name. In chapter 4, verses 2 to 14, we read, The peoples will be tried. And finally, in chapter 4, verses 16 to 21, we read of Israel's rebirth. In this time of renewal, all mortals, not just a few, will receive the charism of prophecy. God offers salvation to all who call on his name. This prophecy shows that all fences will disappear, and according to righteousness, God will judge the nations that have dealt badly with Israel. These times will also have special characteristics. God will dwell in Zion. There will be no trace of foreigners there. He will become a refuge, a refuge for the Israelites. The land will no longer be barren, but from there water will flow to make green trees rich in fruit. We conclude this lesson by trying to find a reasonable explanation of God's wrath. Why would this merciful God become angry? Anger or the wrath of God is a fairly familiar theme in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. St. Paul writes, Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. How can God be at the same time an infinite mercy and fearful anger? The apparent contradiction begins when we realize that speaking of God's wrath is an expression of inexorable opposition to sin. God resolutely rejects all that falsify and spoil his fine creation especially his human creation. Everything that undermines the love, peace, and joy he foresaw calculated for humanity. The wrath of God is his commitment to the complete destruction of sin, and that goes with the feeling of God's wrath that Paul is talking about. The wrath of God is revealed against all immortality and injustice of those who confine the truth to the unrighteous. Sing praises to the Lord, O you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? 
Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. In the New Testament, we learn that God loves his children but detests sin. So if we are to continue sinning, we need to let God judge us on those sins and endure the wrath of God. Our unfortunate relationship with sinning is the reason God sent his only son into the world. Jesus came to free us from our sins. This takes us from an experience of God's wrath to an experience of his love. The depth of God's love is measured by the price he paid to free us, his own son's life. God so very much wanted to free us from the wrath that deserved to be poured down on sin that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him may not die, but may have eternal life. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed this week's lesson. Please join us next Friday for our new video. The answers to this week's questions will be revealed in next week's video. Remember, every Friday at 7 o'clock, the Seeking Wisdom Challenge will be posted on YouTube and Facebook. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, or subscribe to our channel. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below. Thank you for watching, and we wish you a wonderful weekend full of grace and joy.